Giving Turkey Arnold was a plump turkey who'd lived in California all his life and dreamed of traveling to see the rest of the country's many wonders. He woke up one crisp November morning to a very important letter. Dear Mr. Turkey, I'd like to invite you to be the guest of honor at our special Thanksgiving dinner. Please come well-dressed. Sincerely, the President of the United States. Arnold jumped up and started packing his bag. He canceled all of his plans and set off immediately. You haven't eaten your breakfast, Arnold's granny called after him. There's no time to waste, Gran, he said, hustling out the door. I've got a very important appointment. Don't wait up for me. Arnold went straight to the train station. I must get to the president's house before next Thursday, he said to the ticket agent. I'm going to be the guest of honor at the Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, dear, the ticket agent said, clucking her tongue. She handed Arnold the ticket just in time, and he hopped on a train that went past the beautiful Grand Canyon and then round and round the Rocky Mountains. Soon, the mountain's snowy peaks passed and the land turned into broad, green fields. Arnold gobbled with excitement. The old lady sitting next to him peered at him through her glasses. I'm going to spend Thanksgiving with the president, Arnold told her proudly. The lady's eyebrows raised up all the way into her pink hat in surprise. Aren't you worried about what they'll be eating for Thanksgiving at the president's? Of course not. I'm sure that whatever they serve will be delicious. It's the president's dinner after all. Arnold said, waving his wing. Well, I'm on the way to New York to stay with my children for Hanukkah. But do tell the president I say hello, the lady said. It took longer to get to Washington, D.C. than Arnold thought it would. But he couldn't help but cheer when he stepped off the train. He was in a whole new world, where busy people's neckties flapped behind them as they rushed for the subway, and grand historical buildings sat on every corner. I can't believe it, he sighed. I'm finally here. He was swept away by the sights and sounds of the nation's capital. He couldn't even count on his feathers how many museums and monuments he saw, from the Lincoln Memorial all the way to the Smithsonian. Arnold noticed the time with a gasp. He fluttered up and down the street trying to hail a taxi, but none stopped. At this rate, I won't get a taxi until Christmas, he said with a huff. But Arnold was determined. He took three steps back, got a running start, and flew right into a taxi's open window. The president's house, on the double, Arnold squawked. The driver was so shocked, he couldn't think of anything to do but drive to the White House. Arnold rushed up to the biggest house he'd ever seen and pushed through the crowd. The president was already giving a speech. A man in a suit spotted Arnold, plucked him off the ground, and set him on a table. When Arnold looked around at all the guests' hungry faces, he started to get a little nervous. He tried to remember just exactly what it was that people liked to eat for Thanksgiving. Just then, the president walked over. Arnold's eyes grew wide and he held his breath. Hello, Arnold. I was worried you weren't going to make it, the president said. As president of the United States, I hereby pardon you from the Thanksgiving dinner table. Everyone clapped for Arnold, and he let out a big sigh of relief as he shook the president's hand. Arnold went to all of his new favorite spots in Washington, D.C. again, before getting on the train back home. The Gobi and the Shrimp the watchman goby and the pistol shrimp are small animals that live in the ocean's coral reefs. The goby and the shrimp are quite different from one another. For instance, the shrimp has five pairs of swimming legs and five pairs of walking legs, but the goby has eight fins and no legs at all. 
The pistol shrimp gets its name because it has one big snapping claw that shoots out a burst of bubbles to stun predators. Pistol shrimp only grow to two inches long, but they are one of the loudest animals in the ocean. The shrimp is excellent at digging burrows and never seems to run out of energy. However, the shrimp also has bad eyesight and is nearly blind, so it's dangerous for the shrimp to leave its burrow home. The goby, on the other hand, can see just fine and happens to like living in burrows as much as the pistol shrimp does. So, the shrimp and the watchman goby make a deal. The goby becomes the shrimp's eyes and protection, and the goby gets to live in the burrow with a very peppy housekeeper. The two animals work together every day to survive. The shrimp is always building and rebuilding the burrow so that it won't fill up with sand. When the shrimp goes out to eat or tidy up, the goby comes along to watch out for predators. As the shrimp gathers food, it stays close enough to the goby that its antenna is always touching the goby's tail. When the goby sees danger, it shivers its tail and both of them retreat back into the burrow. And if the shrimp wanders off and gets lost, the goby will go out and guide the shrimp all the way back to their home. Pistol shrimp and goby fish cooperate because together they can have a better and longer life. This kind of relationship is called symbiosis. But they aren't the only animals that show symbiosis. In South America, a bird called a cattle tyrant's favorite thing to eat are insects that pester the capybara. The cattle tyrant gets a snack and a ride on the capybara's back, and the capybara has someone around to keep away the pests. Langer monkeys and spotted deer also help each other in nature. The monkeys go from treetop to treetop eating the leaves and allowing some to drop to the ground. The spotted deer follow the monkeys and eat the leaves they've dropped. Spotted deer can see, smell, and hear better than their monkey partners. When the langer monkeys forage on the ground and the deer sense danger, the deer stamp the ground with their hooves so that the monkeys can climb back to safety. Nature has created some great partnerships. These symbiotic creatures know how to stick together. Norman the Caterpillar Autoplay Norman was a caterpillar. He was content with his daily routine. He woke up on the walnut tree, ate leaves until he was full, and spent the rest of the day inching along, in no hurry at all. The world around him always moved so fast. The bees brought nectar to their hive and stung when they were bothered. Chipmunks ran after each other and dug holes. Just the sight of it wore Norman out. Well, I like my life just the way it is. I don't ever want it to change, he said. One morning, he met a worm named Sid. Sid moved slowly and carefully, too. So Norman thought he understood him. All this hubbub is so awful, isn't it? said Norman. Well, I think it's splendid, said Sid. Bees must have such a lovely view. Norman frowned and crept back to the walnut tree. Norman lay down and hid under a fallen leaf. Then he spun a warm blanket of silk around him, shut his eyes, and slept for a long, long time. When Norman finally woke up again, he felt different. He broke open his cocoon and wiggled out. In the evening light, he saw his body. He was covered in a furry white coat. He waddled forward, but every step felt strange and off balance. A gust of wind came and nearly blew him over. All Norman wanted was for everything to be normal again, but he knew it never would be. Sid heard Norman's crying and found him perched on a rock. Sid, it's me, Norman. I fell asleep and now everything is wrong, Norman wept. I wish this had never happened. Sid spoke in a gentle voice. You can't stop change from happening. 
Even the tall walnut tree must let go of all its leaves when winter comes. And the walnut tree was once a seed that changed and it grew into a sapling. But I don't know what to do, said Norman. Sid gave Norman a big smile. You've been asleep for a long time. Maybe if you stretch a little, you'll feel better. So Norman took a deep breath and stretched. Out from his back sprung two beautiful wings. The moon shone down through the branches of the walnut tree, and Norman felt light as a feather. Sid slid out of the way as Norman spread out his wings and flew into the night sky. Oh, this is more wonderful than I ever imagined, Norman shouted. Then he dove down and swept Sid off the ground so that they could share the starry view together. Og and the Beanstalk It wasn't long after Og was born that he started to realize he was different. When he was only three years old, he was too big to sit at the dinner table. His legs were as tall and as thick as tree trunks. Soon, Og grew so big that people started to fear him, screaming and scrambling away when they saw him. He spent his lonely days strumming his mother's harp and watching the sun rise and set on the cloudy kingdom. Og's lonely heart became hard as a rock. He made a home far away and kept only one hen and a bean garden to live on. One day, a beautiful fairy appeared. So you are the terrible giant, she said with a smile. Life has been cruel to you, but I will give you fortunes beyond your imagination. In return, I ask only for five beans from your garden. Fee-fi-fo-fum, Og said, and gave her the beans just so that she would go away. Leave me in peace, the fairy reached for the Og's harp. When she touched it, it turned into gold and started playing by itself. Then she stroked the hen's feathers, and out of it plopped a golden egg. Og barely got a gasp out before the fairy disappeared. Og's luck changed. Not long after, he met a lovely giantess, and together they built a mansion to live in, far away from the people who were unkind. On a fine morning, Og came into the kitchen. He smelled something strange in the air. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, he wondered aloud. But when his wife called it silly, he shrugged and set to counting the coins they had earned. Soon, he nodded off in his chair. When he awoke, the money was gone. He looked everywhere but couldn't find a trace of it. A long while after, Og walked into the kitchen and smelled a familiar smell. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, he said, but his wife told him that he was imagining it. Og still had a feeling something was out of place. He thought he needed to calm down, so he played the magic harp and petted his hen. Barely a minute passed before he fell asleep. Suddenly, Og woke up. He saw a tiny boy running out the front door, carrying his hen and harp. Og jumped out of his chair and chased the thief, but he stumbled over a boulder and lost him. Eventually, Og came to a huge beanstalk. He peered down the hole and saw another land far below. The fairy appeared once again. You have lived such a comfortable life in your mansion. You have forgotten all about me, she said. Now you see how powerful I am. What was given can also be taken away. Og wasn't discouraged. He climbed down the beanstalk after the boy, but the stalk began to teeter this way and that. With a crack, the beanstalk fell from the sky and Og with it. When he hit the ground, it shook like an earthquake. Dizzy, he looked around at all the villagers who were watching him. fee fi fo fum he said. Oh, my poor head. To Og's surprise, the villagers welcomed him and bandaged all his bumps and bruises. 
He even met the boy who had stolen from him, whose name was Jack. When Og learned that Jack and his mother had been hungry and poor, he forgave the boy. Og always wished that people had given him a second chance. Og planted a few of the beans that he had kept in his pocket, and soon people from both lands climbed the beanstalk to and fro. Neither Og nor Jack saw the fairy again and stayed good friends to the end of their days, and they all lived happily ever after. Jack and the Beanstalk In a quiet village long ago, a poor woman sent her son Jack to the market to sell their milk cow so that they could have food to eat. On the way, Jack met a strange man who held out five beans and said, Give me your cow, and I will give you these magical beans that will bring you more fortune than you could imagine. Jack eagerly exchanged the cow for the magical beans. When he came home, his mother gasped, You gave away our cow for a few beans? How will we eat now? She cried and threw the beans out the window. The next morning, where the beans had fallen, an enormous beanstalk rose from the ground all the way into the clouds. When Jack saw it, he was so excited that he climbed it up and up until he reached the very top. Above the clouds, a beautiful land spread out before him. Not far away stood a great mansion. Suddenly, a fairy appeared next to him. Jack, inside that mansion lives a terrible giant who stole this kingdom for himself. Go there and take back what never belonged to him, she said, and vanished. The fairy's words made Jack feel bold, so he followed a path that led right to the front door. Outside the door was the biggest woman Jack had ever seen. Please, Jack said, I don't have anything to eat. Could you help me? The giant woman looked down at tiny Jack and felt sorry for him. Yes, but we must be quick. If my husband finds you, he will eat you in one bite. She brought Jack into the kitchen, but soon they heard the heavy steps of the terrible giant coming down the hall. The giant wife snatched Jack by the collar and hid him in an empty kettle. fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. The giant boomed. Don't be silly, the wife said. You're just smelling the oxen we had for breakfast. The giant glared around the room and grumbled. Fetch me the money bags. He began counting his gold coins, and there were so many that he nodded off before he finished. Jack grabbed the money bags, ran out of the mansion, and hurried back down the beanstalk. The gold coins made Jack and his mother rich, but after a while, Jack made up his mind to climb up the beanstalk again. Jack snuck inside the mansion and hid himself in the oven while the giant's wife was looking away. Soon enough, he heard the terrible giant yell, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman! It's just breakfast that you smell, the giant's wife replied. So the giant told his wife to bring him his golden harp and their hen that laid golden eggs. Lay! The giant told the hen, and a golden egg plopped onto the ground. Sing! The giant told the harp, and it played a lullaby so sweet that the giant fell asleep in his chair. Jack jumped out of the oven, picked up the hen and the harp, and ran. But the giant woke up and saw him. The giant chased Jack all the way to the beanstalk, but he tripped over a boulder and fell. Jack had just enough time to climb down the beanstalk and get his axe. With two great swings, Jack chopped the beanstalk in two. The beanstalk toppled over, and the terrible giant along with it. With the hen and golden harp, Jack and his mother never worried about food again. They lived happily ever after. 
The copy pox. Click on auto. Floyd woke up one morning with a strange tickle in his nose. He sniffled and sniffled and sniffled some more until he felt so woozy he thought he might melt into a pile of Floyd jelly right then and there. Then Floyd felt a sneeze coming on. Hachoo! Went Floyd sneezing right on his favorite book, Peter and the Wolf. Suddenly, the book burst into a tall stack of books. Achoo! Floyd sneezed again. The tower of books grew even higher and came crashing down into a big heap. Oh no! What's happening? He howled. Ah!、Uh, Ah!、Uh, Floyd started grabbing a tissue. Achoo! The tissue multiplied into a cloud of tissues floating in the air. Everything I sneeze on turns from one thing into a whole bunch of things. Floyd wailed. If I sneeze into my elbow, I don't know how I'd ever fix having another set of arms. Floyd wasn't quite sure what to do, but whenever he had a cold, he walked to the store for medicine. So that's where he went. Every few steps he took down the road, he sneezed. Turning a dandelion into a bouquet, a mouse into a dozen mice, an ant into an army of ants, a fly into a noisy swarm, and even a duck into a quacking flock that sent a flurry of feathers into the air. Just then, Floyd heard a familiar voice calling from above. It was Rolly, stuck high up in a tree. Help! Rolly yelled. Help me down! Rolly, how did you get up there? Floyd sniffled. It's a long story, but it has to do with a catapult. Rolly said. Floyd was about to get help, but a fit of sneezes hit him. Floyd's sneeze landed on a rock next to his foot, and with every a choo, the mountain of rocks grew higher and higher. When he looked up again, he was eye to eye with Rolly. Oh, Floyd said. Thanks, Floyd. Rolly said. I didn't know you could do that. Cool. And with that, Rolly rolled right down to the ground. The neighbors heard the racket and could hardly believe what they saw: a red wagon turning into a whole fleet of red wagons, a jumping rope turning into a tangled jumble. Cuz Cuz peered out of his hut, watching with both worry and wonder. Birdie fluttered down from her nest. What's wrong with Floyd? Birdie peeped. Tutu whooshed over just as Floyd sneezed a tricycle into a cluster of wheels and tasseled handlebars. Floyd, Tutu exclaimed, "You have copy pox. We've got to get you to bed before there's an avalanche of all these copies." Floyd's whole company of friends came together to help him get better, making soup and fluffing his massive pillows while dodging his sneezes and trying to contain each new collection of copies. Floyd was happily tucked into a bundle of blankets, feeling better already with all of his friends helping him. Tutu carefully put a hand on Floyd's forehead to check his fever. "You're on the mend," Tutu said. Everyone gathered around the bed, relieved. "You all are the best friends I could ever ask for," Floyd said. "I want to thank, ah,、uh, ah,、uh, that you." They all froze for a moment and looked around to see if there was a herd of cuz cuzes or a troop of tutus. Muggo jumped when he turned and saw a face just like his. But it was just Muggo too. Everyone let out a sigh and laughed, took their vitamins, and left Floyd to sleep, while they figured out what to do with each assortment of copies Floyd had made. And Sue's adventure. Keen Toad and Sue Sheep were best friends. They did almost everything together, which was quite hard because they were so different. Jean's favorite hobby was hopping and splashing in the pond, but Sue hated getting all soggy.
Sue preferred to spend hours standing in the middle of a cozy crowd, which made Jean nervous. It was Jean Toad and Sue Sheep's best friend anniversary, and they decided that today was the day they were going to go on an adventure together. Should we leap into the pond? said Jean Toad. Or should we take the boat? said Sue Sheep. Which of these has the vowel pair ea? Leap or sheep? Leap. So while Jean counted to three, Sue took a deep breath, and then they leaped together into the pond. They swam to the far shore, farther than either of them had ever been. It took a long while for Sue's wool to dry, but when Sue saw that Jean was happy, it made her happy too. Well, look at that tall tree! Jean exclaimed. It's just waiting for us to climb. Or we could sit here and munch on these delicious leaves, Sue proposed. Which of these has the vowel pair ee, -E, tree or leaves? In an instant, Jean climbed to a branch high up in the tree. Even looking at Jean made Sue a little dizzy. But today was for adventures, so Sue tried her best. As soon as Sue started, she got stuck. I don't think I can climb, Jean. I have hooves. You're right, Jean said, hopping down. We could do cartwheels instead. But I can't do cartwheels either. Can't we have adventures we can both enjoy? said Sue. What if we make stories in the clouds? Which of these has the vowel pair OU, down or clouds? Jean Toad looked doubtful. I've never heard of making stories in the clouds before. I can teach you, said Sue, and they lay down on the grass to stare at the sky. Look, over there is a fluffy sheep, like me, and over there is a toad, like you. Then Sue gasped, and over there is a dragon coming straight after us. Oh, this is fun! Jean said excitedly. But the sun is setting now, and I can't remember how to get back home. Do we go that way, or take the trail? Don't worry, I have a very good sense of direction," said Sue. Which of these has the vowel pair ai? Way or trail? Way. Trail. Once they got back home, both of their bellies were groaning and growling hungrily. I could really go for a fly right about now, Jean Toad sighed. Or a fresh baked pie, Sue said. Which of these has the vowel pair ie, fly or pie? They both had the same idea at the same exact moment. How about a fly pie? They cheered. They worked hard baking their best friend pie. Should we use green icing or blue icing? Jean asked. Which of these has the vowel pair ue, green or blue? They took a bite out of the fly pie. It tasted just as yucky as it sounded. I think this is a little too adventurous for me," Jean said with a giggle. "It doesn't matter. You're great just like you are," said Sue. "I love you from my heart all the way to my bow, and you're great just like you are," Jean said. "I love you all the way from my heart to my toes." Which of these has the vowel pair o e, bow or toes? The shark dentist. Doctor Chomper was a shark dentist and a very good one at that. Every day, sharks lined up outside his door to tell him about all their toothaches and pains. 
Gus, the Great White, was Dr. Chomper's first patient of the day. Back so soon? Have you been nibbling on submarines again? asked Dr. Chomper. They always look so tasty, Gus sighed as he sat down in the chair. Yesterday, I had 53 teeth. Today, I have 44. How many teeth have I lost? Hmm, said Dr. Chomper as he peered inside Gus's great big mouth. 44 and what makes 53? I know that 44 plus 6 is 50. Then add 3 more to make 53. 6 plus 3 equals 9. So you've lost 9 teeth. As your dentist, I really must recommend that you stay away from submarines. Oh dear, said Gus. That is quite a lot of teeth. It's a very good thing I have 44 to spare. Then in burst Larry, who was a lemon shark and a very sour fellow. Out of the way, he whined. I have an emergency. Just this morning, a burglar stole 15 teeth right out of my mouth while I was sleeping. Before that, I had 60 teeth. I must know how many I have left so that I could eat at the banquet tonight. Do you know what 60 minus 10 equals, said Dr. Chompers. 60 minus 10 equals 50, of course, Larry said. If you take five more away from 50, you have 45. So 60 minus 15 equals 45. You have 45 teeth which is still plenty of teeth for your banquet, said the dentist, patting Larry on the fin. Shark after shark came in and out, each feeling a little better with their teeth clean and counted. Finally, Dr. Chomper's last patient of the day swam in, a little whale shark pup whose mouth was bigger than her whole body. My name is Carla, she said. I lost 17 teeth today. I know I had 92 before that. Can you help me figure out how many I have left? Why, I'd be honored. 92 minus 17 is, well, oh my, those are very big numbers, Dr. Chomper said, scratching his head. 92 minus 17 is the same as 92 minus 10 minus 7, right? Piped Carla. Right. 92 minus 10 is 82. And 82 minus 7 is... is... Oh, what a long day it's been, sighed the dentist. Seven is the same amount as two and five. So 82 minus two minus five equals 75, Carla said. 92 minus 17 equals 75. Carla and Dr. Chomper cheered together. From that day on, Dr. Chomper had a partner to help him with all of his many patients. Together, he and Carla helped the whole ocean full of sharks take care of their pearly whites. King and the Moon Click on a autoplay. A long time ago, there lived a powerful and wise king who ruled a peaceful kingdom. The king had four children. Two daughters and two sons, whom he loved dearly, so much that his royal banner was divided into four equal parts to represent each of them. One autumn night, when the moon was big and golden, the oldest son went to his father. If you love me, he began, then give me the beautiful moon as a gift. The king was troubled at what his son said. He did not want his son to turn into a greedy man. So he came up with a plan. 
My son, I do love you, but if I give you the whole moon, your brother will be jealous of you, and you will both be unhappy, the king said. The oldest son thought for a moment and decided that even if he owned half of the moon, he would still be a very important man. So he replied, Then bring my brother here, and we will divide the moon in half. The younger brother came, eager to receive his half of the moon. We'll divide the moon down the center, into two halves, an equal share for each of us, he said. And if I give one half to you and one half to your brother, then how will your sisters feel, the king asked. They will think I love my sons more, though I love you all the same. The brothers thought it over. They love their sisters, too. Then we will split the moon into four equal shares. A fourth of the moon for each of us, the king's son said. The little princesses came running when they heard about their father's gift. We'll each have a quarter of the moon, the youngest daughter exclaimed. The king walked to the balcony, and his four children followed, gazing at how the moon shone on the villagers' homes. If I give each of you a fourth of the moon, then all of the people in the city will miss its light and beauty, the king said. As the children stood under the brilliant night sky, they thought about how lovely it was, whole and untouched. They looked out at the villagers on their evening walks, gazing at the moon with wonder and delight. You're right, the oldest daughter said. The moon does not belong to us. It belongs to everyone. Her siblings nodded. The king smiled. When the moon belongs to no one, everyone can enjoy it wherever they go. The royal children remembered their father's words whenever they saw the moon and grew up to be generous and kind leaders. Summertime Blues, written by Caitlin Hardiman. It was a hot summer day, and Floyd was bored. To start his morning, he did some work in the garage with his uncle. Then he played with his dolls, pretended to go to outer space, and read books. He didn't know what else to do. Floyd had the summertime blues. Floyd thought back to the books he read that morning, and he remembered one about being outside in nature. It reminded him of his teacher, Miss Stacy. She had told him to play outside on summer break and use his imagination. Nature is good for you, Miss Stacy had explained. Floyd picked up his nature book and flipped through the pages. He saw pictures of flowers, bees, plants, and trees. He also saw pictures of kids playing outside, making forts with sticks and building sandcastles with sand. Suddenly, Floyd stood up and walked to the window to look around outside. Maybe Miss Stacy was right. Why should I stay inside? Today is the perfect day to go have fun, Floyd whispered to himself. Floyd thought about the fun things he could do for the rest of the day. Just then, as Floyd looked out the window, he noticed a squirrel run by. Next, he saw a bird flying in the sky. Wow, those animals seem to be having a lot of fun, he thought. I want to get a closer look. Floyd told his mom he was going outside, and he skipped through the door to his backyard. Everywhere he looked, he saw interesting animals. Birds, squirrels, butterflies, and dragonflies were enjoying nature right at his fingertips. All of a sudden, he heard a familiar voice. Hi, Floyd. My dad wanted me to find something to do, and he said I could come over to play, said Cuz Cuz. Floyd smiled and gave Cuz Cuz a high five. Thanks for coming over. I just came outside because I couldn't find anything else to do either, he said. Floyd and Cuz Cuz started playing right away. I wish it wasn't so hot outside, said Floyd, but I'm happy you are here. First, the friends decided to build a sand castle in the sandbox. They made the bottom of the castle by putting wet sand in a round cake pan and flipping the pan over. After they finished building, Floyd remembered his mom had asked him to water the plants. He found two watering cans and handed one to Cuz Cuz. Can you help me water the plants? asked Floyd. Sure, exclaimed Cuz Cuz. 
As Floyd and Cuzcuz watered the plants, they saw bees sucking the nectar from the flowers. Those bees sure are busy, said Cuzcuz. Just like us, said Floyd. Did you know that bees have five eyes? I learned that in my nature book this morning. After Floyd and Cuzcuz finished watering the plants, they decided to play another game. They pretended to be buzzing bees. They imagined that they could fly around the yard and suck the sweet nectar from the flowers. They ran fast and made buzzing noises in between their giggles. Let's take a break, said Cuzcuz. I'm one tired bee. Me too, gasped Floyd. Worker bees must be tired after a long day of collecting nectar. The good friends found a cool spot under a tree in Floyd's yard. They laid on the grass and looked up at the sky. Floyd and Cuzcuz were tired from playing outside all afternoon and running around like bees. They both felt happy that they had found something to do on that hot summer day. Wasn't it nice playing outside? asked Cuzcuz. It was. I had so much fun, replied Floyd. After being outside all afternoon, the two friends were thirsty. Floyd, can we get something to drink? asked Cuzcuz. I'm as thirsty as a camel. Sure, let's go inside and get a cold drink of water, said Floyd. He led his friend through the door and into the kitchen. The boys enjoyed the cool glass of water. Floyd and Cuzcuz relaxed at the kitchen table and talked about the fun they had had that day. Do you remember when you stepped on the sand castle and crushed it? That was so funny, Cuzcuz said. Oops, sorry about that, Floyd laughed. Just then, Floyd had an idea. Cuzcuz, let's create our own nature books, Floyd suggested. Great idea. That way, we won't forget our special day, replied Cuzcuz. The boys spent the rest of the afternoon creating books. They used crayons, colored pencils, scissors, glue, and construction paper to make their books. That night before bed, Floyd looked through his book. It put a smile on his face. He thought of Miss Stacy and how she would be proud that he had used his imagination today. He took a boring day and made it a day to remember. The End I Love My Body, written by April Brown Introduction Hi, my name is Rianne. I love my body. My body helps me do so many things. Taking care of my body and using my body to move makes me happy. Moving my body My dad likes to move his body too. Sometimes he lets me use his boxing gloves. He holds the punching bag so I can hit it. I can hit the bag really hard. Riding my bike in my neighborhood is one of my favorite things to do. Before I ride my bike, I put on my helmet. My helmet protects my head if I fall. Then I use my strong legs to pedal and make the wheels go fast. Taking care of my body. Because my body is important to me, I have to take care of it. One way I take care of my body is by keeping my teeth clean. I always brush my teeth in the morning and at night. Another way I take care of my body is by washing my hands. I wash my hands before I eat, when I play outside in the mud, and every day after school. It's important to keep my hands clean so I don't get sick from germs. All day I use my body to do the things I love. It's important for me to get enough rest. Sleep gives me energy so I can play again tomorrow. My dad reads me a story and I drift into a deep sleep. Eating healthy. I keep my body healthy by eating things that are good for me. When I wake up in the morning, my favorite breakfast is oatmeal and raisins. Oatmeal gives my body energy so I can do the things I love. For lunch, my dad packs me a turkey sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and avocado. I have a special water bottle that I bring to school every day. My body needs a lot of water to stay healthy. My body parts. I also love to learn about my body parts. Have you ever felt your heartbeat? Your heartbeat is slower when you aren't moving. After you run, your heartbeat goes fast. Even though you can't see them, bones are very important. Humans have a skeleton that is made of bones. 
Bones are hard and protect the organs inside your body. If you break a bone, it can heal with a cast. Did you know that your bones are covered with muscles? Muscles help us move, jump, dance, and play. We can make our muscles strong by staying active and exercising. I love to give my muscles a workout. My dad always says, love the skin you're in. We all have different amounts of melanin in our skin. That's why skin colors can be different. The outside of our body is much more colorful than the inside. No matter what I'm doing, whether I'm sitting, standing, or playing, I'm always breathing. When I'm tired or upset, I sit on the ground and breathe slowly. I like to put my hand on my belly to feel my stomach go up and down. Conclusion I love my body, and I love being me. My body helps me do so many things, and I love to take care of it. Every day, my dad tells me I'm strong. I think I'm strong, too. Glossary. Bones. Bones make up a person's skeleton. Heartbeat. Your heartbeat is the sound of your heart as it pumps blood. Melanin. Melanin is the part of your body that makes your skin, hair, and eyes a certain color. Muscles. Your muscles cover your bones and help you move. Skeleton. Your skeleton is the structure of bones that supports you. I Love Running, written by April Brown. I love running. When I run really fast, I feel like I'm flying. Sometimes I pretend that I'm a bird or a plane high up in the sky. I barely feel my feet hit the ground. I love the feeling of running with the wind in my hair. The cool breeze helps me run better. I am on the track team at school. Every weekend I run races. Sometimes the races are at my school, and sometimes they are at other schools. My family and friends like to watch me race. Some of the races that I run are short. They are called sprints. When I run sprints, I go really fast. I stay focused and challenge myself to run faster, faster, faster. Sometimes I run longer races. These are called cross-country races. When I run cross-country, I go at a steady pace. Sometimes I think about my favorite song while I run. Other times, I only think about the finish line. Running cross-country is hard because you don't want to get worn out right away. You need to pace yourself so you can run far. I try not to run too fast in the beginning. Instead, I save my energy so I can keep running. No matter how long the race is, it's important to train ahead of time. Training means that you practice running. It helps you get stronger. Runners train in many different ways before a race. When I train, I don't just practice running. I also do exercises to get my body ready to run. I lift weights and do stretches. Exercising makes me stronger and protects me from getting hurt. Runners need fuel to keep up on race day, so I keep my body strong by eating healthy. I make sure to eat lots of fruits, vegetables, and proteins. I drink a lot of water, too. A healthy diet gives me energy. Before races, it's important to get enough rest. I try to sleep for at least 9 or 10 hours every night. Your muscles need time to heal and grow. Getting enough sleep helps you feel ready to run. When I take care of my body, I have lots of energy for my races. I love feeling how strong and healthy my body is. Taking care of my body makes me feel proud of myself. I feel the strongest when I'm running. When I run track, I love to win races. I always feel a rush of energy when I cross the finish line. I feel even better when I cross the finish line first. Even if I don't come in first, I still feel good because running is my favorite thing to do. I never give up, and I always try my best. I also like to see my teammates win races. When my teammates win, I feel like I win too. I like to give my friends high fives after they cross the finish line. 
We all work together when we run races, and I know that we are a great team. When the races are over, I get really tired. After running, I make sure to take it easy for the rest of the day. Sometimes I take a nap or read a book. Relaxing helps my body prepare for the next race. After taking it easy, I look forward to running again. I love running. It's my favorite sport. Whether I'm racing with my track team or running around my neighborhood, it is my favorite thing to do. Being a good runner helps me stay active with my friends too. You don't have to be on a track team or in races to enjoy running. Many of my friends enjoy running just for fun.